The Feynman Lilly debate. Question What is the original sin of humankind? Answer Confusing our neurology for ontology. The human dilemma is that we have an innate tendency to conflate our current brain state with how reality, apart from ourselves, really is, forgetting in the process that our subjective experiences may be inaccurate or misleading representations of our objective surroundings. There are, of course, good evolutionary reasons for why this is the case, since in our struggle for survival we have to rely on our mental maps, and take them seriously, in order to find food, ward or fight off enemies, secure housing, find mates, protect offspring, and so on. But often, our internal projections can be deceiving, especially if our relatively stable waking state gets biochemically altered. Cognitive impairments such as Alzheimer's, dementia, amnesia, bipolar disorder, and fever-induced deliriums dramatically change how we interact and interpret the world around us. We can also consciously manipulate our consciousness by ingesting a variety of drugs, each providing a slightly different lens by which to see ourselves and others. In religion, there is a long history of individuals who have had inner visions and inspirations that they have taken to be revelations from God or a higher power and have created their own unique movements on the basis of it. That such mystical encounters may be only byproducts of their own minds and have nothing to do with angels or divine beings doesn't arise, since its evidential reality is too overwhelming to doubt. What we confront here is a perennial conundrum. Given that mystical experiences are plentiful, and that our brains seem almost universally wired for them, the outstanding question that remains is one of explanation. How do we best interpret and adjudicate these apparently transcendental excursions, and how? Scientific Friends Who Disagree Richard Feynman and John Lilly Richard Feynman, 1918 to 1988, is well known and well regarded for his contributions to quantum electrodynamics, or QED, for which he won a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965, along with Sinitiro Tomonaga and Julian Schwinger. But what may come as a surprise to those not conversant with his life and work is that Richard Feynman was also deeply interested in out-of-body experiences and became adept at it after becoming acquainted with John Lilly, 1915 to 2001, a pioneer in the field of dolphin research who had developed sensory deprivation tanks in the 1950s. Despite becoming friends, Feynman and Lilly parted company with each other over how best to interpret inner experiences while out of the body. Feynman argued that all such phenomena were hallucinatory in nature, whereas Lilly felt that they revealed something far beyond the rational mind and the restrictive limits of empirical science. Richard Feynman recalls how he first met John Lilly. I used to give a lecture every Wednesday over at Hughes Aircraft Company, and one day I got there a little ahead of time and was flirting around with the receptionist as usual, when about half a dozen people came in, a man, a woman, and a few others. I'd never seen them before, the man said, is this where Professor Feynman is giving some lectures? This is the place, the receptionist replied. The man asks if this group can come to the lectures. I don't think you'd like them much, I say. They're kind of technical. Pretty soon the woman, who was rather clever, figured it out. I bet you're Professor Feynman. It turned out the man was John Lilly, who had earlier done some work with dolphins. He and his wife were doing some research into sense deprivation and had built some tanks. Isn't it true that you're supposed to get hallucinations under those circumstances? I asked, excitedly. That is true indeed. I had always had this fascination with the images from dreams and other images that come to the mind that haven't got a direct sensory source and how it works in the head and I wanted to see hallucinations. 
I had once thought to take drugs, but I got kind of scared of that. I love to think, and I don't want to screw up the machine. But it seemed to me that just lying around in a sense deprivation tank had no physiological danger, so I was very anxious to try it. I quickly accepted the Lily's invitation to use the tanks, a very kind invitation on their part, and they came to listen to the lecture with their group. While Feynman took up Lily's offer, he resisted the mystical overlay that surrounded the deprivation tank hoopla, calling such mystic hokey-poke, wick-whack things, and most curiously, all kinds of gorp. Yet, Feynman found his experiences deeply fascinating and enriching, despite his skeptical interpretations. With repeated sessions in the saltwater tank, he became adept at leaving his body and experiencing all sorts of intriguing phenomena. As Feynman recounts, I had many types of out-of-the-body experiences. Nature isn't classical, dammit, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. Richard Feynman. One time, for example, I could see the back of my head with my hands resting against it. When I moved my fingers, I saw them move, but between the fingers and the thumb, I saw the blue sky. Of course, that wasn't right. It was a hallucination. But the point is that as I moved my fingers, their movement was exactly consistent with the motion that I was imagining that I was seeing. The entire imagery would appear and be consistent with what you feel and are doing, much like when you slowly wake up in the morning and are touching something and you don't know what it is, and suddenly it becomes clear what it is. So the entire imagery would suddenly appear, except it's unusual in the sense that you usually would imagine the ego to be located in the front of the back of the head, but instead you have it behind the back of the head. Throughout it all, Feynman remains the scientific skeptic, even as he becomes increasingly disoriented by what occurs while experiencing an OBE. He also continually attempts to differentiate what is happening from mere dreaming. Feynman elaborates. One of the things that perpetually bothered me psychologically while I was having a hallucination was that I might have fallen asleep and would therefore be only dreaming. I had already had some experience with dreams, and I wanted a new experience. It was kind of dopey, because when you're having hallucinations and things like that, you're not very sharp. So you do these dumb things that you set your mind to do, such as checking that you're not dreaming. So I perpetually was checking that I wasn't dreaming by, since my hands were often behind my head, rubbing my thumbs together back and forth, feeling them. Of course, I could have been dreaming that, but I wasn't. I knew it was real. After the very beginning, when the excitement of having a hallucination made them jump out or stop happening, I was able to relax and have long hallucinations. Notice that Feynman never actually believes that his experiences are anything more than fantastic, even if extraordinarily lucid hallucinations, a word he uses repeatedly when describing his exteriorizations. Because of this dismissive attitude, Lilly reprimanded Feynman in a letter and accused him of being non-scientific. Interestingly, when John Lilly had mystical experiences of what he perceived as otherworldly beings in his sensory deprivation tank, after taking mind-altering drugs such as ketamine, he argued strongly for their ontological objectivity. Whereas Richard Feynman, who had similar experiences as Lilly, they were friends, labeled his out-of-body excursions as hallucinations. Feynman's categorical dismissal miffed Lilly, who then criticized him in a personal letter with the terse rebuttal, you stop being a scientist the instant you said that word, hallucination. Feynman countered Lilly's assertion by pointing out that whatever out-of-body experiences he was having, and Feynman recalls becoming very good at it, didn't correlate to the outside world, even when undergoing the dissociation, he thought they did. It was for this reason that he tried to convince Lily that the imagination that things are real does not represent true reality. If you see golden globes or something several times, and they talk to you during your hallucination and tell you they are another intelligence, 
it doesn't mean they're another intelligence. It just means that you have had this particular hallucination. I believe there's nothing in hallucinations that has anything to do with anything external to the internal psychological state of the person who's got the hallucination. 